All right, by now, guys, you know, I love talking about old wrestling. What you might not know is it's not my real passion. My real passion is helping people save money. My real passion is getting families out of apartments and into houses. My real passion is getting people's finances aligned so they can retire on time. I hated going to Walmart and seeing the greeter being 80 years old. She should not be working. She should be home. Why is she still working? Because she still has a mortgage. I want to help avoid that for you. The other thing I want to help you with, let's make sure your kids don't get saddled with student loans. If you've got a student loan, why did you get one? Maybe because your parents still had a mortgage. I'm not saying that to be fun. I'm being sincere. There's only so much money to go around. What I want to help you do is figure out where you are right now and where you want to be long-term. And I do it at SaveWithConrad.com. I've been doing mortgages for more than 20 years. And during all that time, we've helped tens of thousands of families change their life. I mean, routinely, we're helping our podcast listeners save five, six, seven, eight hundred bucks a month, but more importantly, get them out of debt faster and with cheaper monthly payments. But if you don't think it can happen for you, let me just tell you this. We are not the bank. We don't say no. We say not yet, but here's how. We're going to get you a game plan on how to improve your credit, how to save a little bit of cash and how to get into that dream house. Maybe you're already in the house, but it would be nice if someday we could put a pool in the back or one day we want to upgrade to hardwood floors or remodel the kitchen or get a badass master bathroom. I can help you do all of that with no money out of pocket right now at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket. And if we can't help you save some cash, we won't waste your time. Check it out. SaveWithConrad.com, NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. And hey, y'all, don't take my word for it. Check us out. We've got an A-plus with the Better Business Bureau. And as if that's not enough, go look at our reviews. Read them and weep, haters. ConradReviews.com. You'll see more than a thousand five-star reviews. Our average review is 4.72 stars. Find out how much money you can save. Take control of your life in 2023 by taking control of your finances. We're going to show you how to keep more of your own money. If you've got credit card debt, what are you paying on that? 14%, 28%, you know, you can do better with the mortgage though. You may not know this. The interest you pay is tax deductible. And we can even show you how to skip your next two house payments. So if you can get a lower monthly payment, pay your debt off faster, get a greater tax deduction at the end of the year. And right now, right after the holidays, skip your next two payments, buddy, this is the biggest no brainer in the history of the world. Find out how much money you can save right now for free at savewithconrad.com. Or Hey man, shoot me an email directly. Conrad at savewithconrad.com. Thompson and you're listening to Foley is pod. And of course we couldn't do it without the hall of famer, the hardcore legend himself, Mr. Mick Foley. Mick, how are you, man? I'm doing great. Uh, thank you, Conrad. And I feel good about the decisions I just made. You were here. I was, I said, I'm going to leave the fanny pack on the teeth out. Hey, you know what? It's one of those hardcore episodes. We're going to talk about Royal rumble 2000. One of, if not my favorite match of your entire career, but before we do, boy, there's a lot of news and notes. Let's start right at the beginning. Since you and I recorded, I saw you had a chance to catch up with the Funker. How is Mr. Funk I these did. days? You know, Terry was in great spirits. Uh, Dick Murdoch's uh, son and daughter were there. Uh, Terry's uh, daughter, one of his daughters was there. Uh, and it was like, you know, like a celebratory atmosphere. Uh, we were recording uh, for a, a show, Dark Side of the Ring. Uh, but it was a happy, it was a happy atmosphere. Like if they're going to get the dark side of, you know, this is Abdullah the Butcher, who we just talked about in our last episode, somebody else can cover that part. Uh, this is about some, you know, some great experiences we both had with Abdullah. And then Terry and I watched, uh, the finals of the King of the Death match tournament together. Wow. And that was, that was really interesting. So... I think I, I wrote, I can't remember, it was a 500 mile or 400 mile. Um, I have a circle around Amarillo in my mind. And anytime I'm within 400 or 500 miles, I'm going to make that trip to see the Funker. So I happen to be, it worked out good. I got to visit my daughter in Colorado because I had, I would like to think as a dad, I would have been there anyway, regardless of how close I was. 
but I was about uh, seven hours from Albuquerque, and that sounds crazy. I know that sounds crazy to pe- you know a lot of people out there. They'll you know, you know, a ninety-minute drive is considered uh, you know it's kind of lengthy. Yes. But for us, you know, I think it's a blessing uh, being in the wrestling world. Like seven hours, yeah, absolutely, I'm making that drive. And then uh, Amarillo was only four hours from Albuquerque, wow. and so that was a no-brainer. So it was it was really nice to see Terry. I don't know when the next time I'm out that way is. Um, I'll check. I'm doing a convention in Austin, Texas, the beginning of September. I'll have to do the circle. And you know what? Even if it is further than 500, that's a pretty easy one-way flight, I believe. So uh, I'll be checking up on, on Terry in September as well. Speaking of uh, appearances, the rumor is you might be in <laughs> San Antonio this weekend. I will be there. I will be there. I was a late entry. I know this is still forbidden territory, although it seems, I'll go on record saying it seems kind of silly to deny that I am part. I'll just say I'm part of the upcoming season because if WWE airs a trailer and I'm in it, right. I think that is at least room to say I'm in it. Yes. Now, you know, we, you and I know uh, my involvement's been substantial. And that may lead to the next uh, subject, was whether or not I have heat with WWE. Uh, should we jump right into well, let's that? Let's jump right into it. All of right. course, as you and I are recording this, uh, we're one day removed from the 30th anniversary of Raw. Of course, this weekend, everybody's talking about the Royal Rumble. Yeah. We'll table the Rumble talk for a moment. Uh, but our old pal Vince Russo had a theory as to why you weren't on the 30th anniversary show when so many other legends were. And he thought, maybe uh, the Micker had some heat. What gives? <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, I will say I have had some heat over the years. I, I, there may be, you know, maybe if you polled everyone in WWE, maybe I have heat with someone that I'm not aware of. But to the best of my knowledge, like everything's going really well. I'm involved to some extent with this show on WWE. Uh, I've spent more time in Connecticut. You know, not necessarily WWE headquarters, but right up the road working with WWE personnel on a show I'm I'm really proud of. I'm really, really proud of this. But there's an extravagant amount of traveling because I have to travel to where and when, to where the talent is available when they are available. So it's not like logistically a loop is being set up. It's not like they're going, okay, what's best for, I'm about to do Vince, what's best for Mike? Basically, you know, if I if I can visit the milk truck, the milk truck in Modesto, California, I got to go out and and see that milk truck when Kurt Angle is available. Right. And you know, Bill Goldberg is a man of uh, you know he's got a lot of things uh, on the plate, so I've got to go out to Kansas when Bill's available. Not because he lives there, but that's because um, the uh, that's that's where our collector is. And so, just for example, there was one three-day stretch where I went from Florida to Modesto, California, Modesto, California to Boston. Oh, man. Boston to Hutchinson, Kansas, which is not a direct flight. No. And then back to Florida. And so you're literally putting like 30 flying hours together by the time you're done. And especially if something's not nonstop. You know, I, I always... Uh, it can be very time consuming. So I always consider the time door to door. Yes. So that someone go, I remember like WWE used to say that it was like a 16 hour flight to Afghanistan. Maybe once you get everybody to California, it's 16 hours, but but door to door, it's about a 40 hour trip. Wow. So uh, for example, visiting Steve Austin at his ranch, is more time consuming than going to other countries. It just is. It's about wow. a 13 hour one way trip and I'm glad to do it, which might explain why Steve wasn't on uh, Raw either. Right. And that's not a matter of heat, that's just a matter probably of a guy saying, I don't wanna travel 26 hours sure. round trip, especially on uh, uh, the 30th anniversary of Raw, uh, like every anniversary falls in that third week of January where they have, to me, the second biggest show of the year to promote. So you know going in that there's only room for like three speaking roles. Right. And that everyone else is in the poker game. Mm -hmm. So that's a long way to go. Uh, When you only, when you've been on the road for 25 days or whatever the case is, and you just want to see your family. So in the interest of full disclosure, like 
I've, I've visited my mom. That's a four day block. Right. But you know, I'm a son. I'm trying to be there for her. So I include that. And even now, right before we took the air, uh, I was trying to uh, change my rental car schedule because I realized that instead of uh, that, if I uh, change my schedule and instead of flying out of Huntsville to Chicago for the next uh, uh, episode that I may or may not be hosting, <laughs> <laughs> that if I chose instead to drive eight and a half hours, I could see my family and still kind of be there by sure. the time. And so that's the decision I, I made is you put a lot of value on that time at home, especially when you're in like a four or five month block where you haven't been home very much. And I just felt like I needed those two days with my family more than the show needed me. And besides that point, I did, I did say to John Cohn, I said, John, I said, um, I've also got, we, we've, we've got the show you know, to promote in the 25th year anniversary of Hell in a Cell. I, I, last time I was on WWE programming was a little over two years ago for The Undertaker's uh, t uh, tribute. And I think the last time I had a speaking role was a year before that. So if it's my first thing in time in three years, I just feel like there's more of a contribution that I could make. Yes. Uh, if it comes to helping promote the show or something that perhaps Undertaker and I can do together to, to honor the 25th anniversary of the cell match. And all that went into the decision-making process. Uh, and I came up with the idea that it would be better for me to be at home for that particular show. But there's no heat. No. I enjoyed the show. But like I said, there's like three speaking roles there for the legends, and it's a lot of fun. But I just decided it'd be better for everyone if I just, uh, you know, took a pass and showed up a couple months later. Not to say that we're going to get into the rumor and innuendo business, but there's a lot of talk about what to expect this weekend. And Ooh, as we get into WrestleMania yeah. season, uh, there's uh, Nick Khan doing a podcast denying – any knowledge, he wouldn't commit one way or another as to what The Rock would or wouldn't do. Then we saw a report that... Wait, that, his picture's not on this? What's up with that? Oh, no. Oh, maybe the Black Adam promotion's over. I don't know. But it's anyway, this though. is... Check still... it out. Old Dwayne doing the best he can, man. It's getting by. Um, there's another report that says he, he wouldn't be able to make the schedule work. He wouldn't be able to get into, quote-unquote, wrestling shape in time. Then we saw a report just earlier this week that Perhaps Stone Cold had a big money offer to do something at WrestleMania. I think Sean Ross Sapp thought maybe it was him versus Roman Reigns, and I think Dave Meltzer said no, he was actually offered Brock Lesnar. Would you be surprised to see Rock and Austin at WrestleMania? Well, I'd be very surprised. I'd be really happy. You know, Steve was surprised. I don't know if I'm supposed to be talking about <laughs> seeing Steve. Maybe that's supposed to be a big surprise. But I think they actually show us on the trailer. Yes. You know, and it's beautiful snow-covered landscape. I woke up. I did have a day off in a hotel. I got there. It was 57 degrees, you know, in uh, the wilds of uh, uh, Nevada where Steve lives. And the next day, it was the heaviest snowfall as far as the thickest snowflakes I've ever seen. This was the same day that Jeremy Renner was injured oh, wow. not far from where I was. So that snow was really coming down, made for a beautiful landscape. But Steve was surprised when I told him, he at least he, if he wasn't surprised, he did a good job of feigning surprise yes. when I told him his match was my favorite of the, the previous mania. And he was like, why is that kid? I was like, yeah, well, everyone want to see you. Yes. You over-delivered. Yes. Owens did a re remarkable job of putting that thing together without one faith. He didn't see, even see Steve, right? I mean... Steve uh, did a, 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 video. a video, and it was up to Kevin it, with some of the greatest uh, verbiage, you know, just incredible. Just describing the landscape of Texas being flat and uninspired. That's, I love it. It's beautiful. And so Steve was surprised, but I don't think he should have been, because I think, you know, the uh, feedback was almost universally yes. glowing. Uh, but I would be surprised to see both of them. I'll tell you what I think has been missing from the Rumble because it's all you always want to juggle, you know, the, the mainstays, the surprises, uh, the up and coming uh, talent. I thought last year, unless I'm completely wrong and confusing it, confusing it with another Rumble, 
was lacking a little bit because there were none of those surprises. Yeah, I agree. And there was none of the NXT talent either. Uh, going back a few years to the first time I saw Rhea Ripley and even my wife who's seen just about everything, was like, who is that? Like, she stood out and had star power written all over her. Yes. And, you know, we see that on a weekly basis now. Uh, by the way, <laughs> Dominic has Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's just tremendous. It's just tremendous. Yes. Here's a guy that a year ago I would have said, oh, man, I know he's a nice young man. He's Ray's son, but what are you going to do with the guy? Yeah. And now he's a highlight of the show. You know, yes. the teardrops and the hard time he did. It's just a great, it's a great storyline and uh, a lot of fun to watch. And I'd be remiss, since we're talking about fun to watch, if we didn't mention the trial of Sami Zayn. Unbelievable. This is the, this guy is the gift that keeps giving. It's the, he's the wrestler of the year the last year. <laughs> just storyline-wise, it's the, you're exactly right. You hit the nail on the head. And I love the fact, it's the subtleties. Even if they didn't point out that, Paul was just looking at Roman the whole time Roman was looking at the screen because Paul went out there, Paul Heyman for the uninitiated, uh, Paul went out there and, you know, he firmly in the fire uh, Sammy camp yes. or revenge on Sammy. And then I love that Jimmy comes up. He comes in as the defense and it's this remark. It's really good TV, right? Absolutely. Really good TV. And now Paul is like, I think, feeling the vulnerability because he's gone out there and he's been overruled by the tribal chief. Mm -hmm. And you just have, a, it's a great storyline. Sammy is so much fun. Uh, he always delivers in the ring, always yes. has. Yes. But he's become one of the best characters and has been for, I'd say, a handful of years. So uh, Sammy Zayn is your wrestler of the year in WWE? I think the last year, I mean, my match of the year last year was the Cody Rhodes cage match okay. with uh, Seth Rollins. What a story that was. Yeah, incredible. With the torn pack. I but thought you were going to go with the <laughs> Johnny Knoxville. I'm tell, the, I think that is the most underrated WrestleMania match last year. Like, <laughs> I know that there's, it's not going to be compared to Stone Cold right. or some of the hard-hitting classics, but that exceeded all of my yeah. expectations. And I think uh, uh, Kevin Owens had the great tweet where he said something to the effect of every second of that rule. Yes. And, uh, it and, was fun. Oh, it was fun. When I talked to you, I don't know if you mentioned this off air or on air. I was like, wasn't well, that a great mania? Not like a Kool-Aid guy, but yes. just like a guy who had watched it for two nights and really enjoyed himself. Talking about me in the third person uh, or second person. But you said it was fun. So you weren't with the, it was great, but it was definitely fun and had some great moments. I think the decision to make it a two night, a two, two day, it's so good. Yes. And I think I've, I've expressed my opinion that it's almost impossible to have that classic match at the end of a seven hour yes. show. The crowd's just dead and you just, you need that. I don't care how good the, uh, the, uh, the match itself is, you need that intangible, which is the magic element of a hot crowd or else it's not going to reach that level. It just can't. So, uh, I'm really excited about the prospect of one of those guys. I want some. I want a couple surprises. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was I was really lucky that I was one of those surprises in 2008 and 2012, and I think in 2008 Roddy was in it and Snuka was in it. Like we we like those surprises. I think that's been missing. At least last year was missing. So I'm hoping for a great rumble. I will be, oh, the reason I'm in San Antonio yes. is because um, I have one uh, last day of um, on location shooting to do outside of San Antonio. And then we probably have a, a couple extra days left uh, in the studio to do wraparounds or pickups or whatever we call them. Um, and as long as I'm going to be there, yeah. uh, my dear friend, uh, Lita, fellow Hall of Famer, mentioned that she and Trish were doing a convention. And I was like, as long as I'm there. Might as well. And, and you've seen me at these things. Like, I genuinely like yes. these conventions. Yes. I know for it's not everybody's cup, cup of, of tea. tea. It's not. It can be really difficult. I remember uh, Beverly D'Angelo did her first Comic-Con. And uh, she she wrote to her uh, her brother and just said uh, she was wiped out, you know, just one day in. It's it can be really difficult to be on for such yes. a long period of time, but if you genuinely like 
your fans like yeah. I do, and uh, and I do I have I'm not opposed to making some money, uh, but I ha if I didn't have a good time I wouldn't be doing that. That's right. I try to keep it in moderation so the schedule coming up is like two a month, but I really enjoy them and I'll enjoy seeing people in uh, San Antonio. So if you're in the area, please stop by and visit the table. I will exceed your expectations. Our friends at WrestleCon, Michael Bacchicchio and company, putting it together. We've got a graphic up on our YouTube right now with all the information, and we'll be sure to tweet it out on our account, Foley is Pod. I also want to ask about uh, another member of the Rumble before we talk about more current stuff and maybe one other piece of news we should address. Yeah. We saw the, the wonderful return videos promoting the return of Cody Rhodes. Yeah. He's going to be back in action. It felt reminiscent of uh, Triple H's return in 2002. The quad tear, yep. And uh, to show you how effective, you know, the, the uh, WWE or in wrestling in general, you know, the visual process can be. To this day, I think people remember the beautiful day video. Yes. Because it really touched people, and you saw how hard this guy was working. Cody was one of the gutsiest performances, yeah. you know, in, in recent memory. It remind, you know, like Mahomes with the high ankle sprain, you know, gutting it out. Like, these are great performances. Cody, you know, with an even worse injury, even though it's in a an atmosphere where you can work around and emphasize, like, we're, we have that luxury. That doesn't take away from the fact it was an incredible gutsy performance, and I would be absolutely fine with Cody winning that rumble and going on uh, to face the opponent of his choice. I would be very cool with that. I, I sort of liken Cody's uh, cage match performance with the torn peck to Kurt Schilling with the bloody sock on the bloody mound. Sock. I was there that night at Yankee Stadium. It, it was yeah. such a moment in sports history, and you felt like you're watching something that shouldn't be, but it was, and yeah. it was fantastic. And I wondered from your perspective. You know, I just want to tell you, since I was there and I watched uh, – a shilling. Took a little something. <laughs> got a little. No, he didn't. A little get Henson it. shaving helper. <laughs> hey, let, let's talk about Cody because you mentioned a minute ago you really like and missed the surprises last year. Yeah. No surprise here. We announced ahead of time, but the video was so well done. I don't know if that's uh, Pucciarelli or Jeremy Borash or who helped put that together, but it was phenomenal. Yeah. And it did remind me of the old Hunter video from 20 years ago or maybe 21 now, but I'm curious from your perspective, uh, would Cody have been a surprise or did everybody kind of expect it either yeah. way? Well, you, I think it's a juggling act. You want the surprises. Cody might be too big to be a surprise. Yeah. Although there have been huge surprises. I think you need to get people excited about the rumble on one hand, your surprises don't have, I mean, we've got, um, um, you know, c quite a cachet of legendary wrestlers to pick from. Yeah. If you remember a few years ago, the 25th anniversary, it was great to see so many familiar faces, but about half the women that we saw showed up on the rumble where it wasn't nearly the surprise it would have been if we hadn't seen them six days earlier. There you go. So again, it's that uh, delicate juggling act. I think we only saw one female uh, legend, right? Medusa? Yeah, Blonde that's right. Blaze, the only right. one. So I wonder what the deal was there and why uh, WWE did not know. I might, now I've got heat for real. Why weren't there more women on the show? Um, well, I, I think the rumor is there was a lot of stuff that was cut for time, including the ladies' cage match. Oh, I think yeah, that yeah. That first hour So was that was what I said when... Uh, uh, I was in bad need of a shower, bad need, you know. I couldn't show up and do this to you and Grillo. Uh, I appreciate that. You know, I am trying to save the earth by using less detergent, and I think I've been effective in that one-man campaign. But it was time, you know. The dogs are barking, as they say. And uh, I'd asked the, the kids to record the match, and when I came out, they said it was over. And I, it's the first thing I said, it was probably cut for time. Yeah. Which is a shame because it was the first cage match in... Since like 04, I think, yeah, for the ladies. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, 19 years, they said. So that I, was a shame. I'm excited to see. I, I, I assume at some point we will get some sort of make good on that. Uh, but from what I understand, that first hour, things just ran long. Yeah. And that's unfortunate, but uh, it, it kind of is what it is. I, I do want to bring up something else before we talk about Royal Rumble 2000, uh, we lost a member yeah. of our wrestling community in the most horrendous, horrible way possible. Jay Briscoe lost his life last week. Uh, his little girls are still in a, in a big fight 
We'll throw up the the uh, link below so you can go ahead and make a donation to his family if you're so inclined to do so. But, uh, man, talk about a guy who was maybe at the peak of his career and now gone way, way too soon. I'm curious what you thought of his work and if you had a chance to meet or spend any time with Mr. Briscoe. I didn't know either Jay or Mark that well, um, but I saw them uh, a number of times over the years. I did a little article. I think the first time I saw them was 2005, I believe, or 2006. I had helped uh, carry uh, the Ring of Honor owner find a building on Long Island. It was a place about 10 minutes from my house, and I, I knew the guy who was the events coordinator. He uh, ran a world-class haunted attraction there, and so I felt good that here was a company I really enjoyed working for. I was able to land them a good building, and then I went to the show. And I even dropped an elbow on Jimmy Rave from the ring apron. You know, I was I was feeling it, um, and that was the first time I saw those. I believe, you know, it may turn out I, I met them in two thousand four. I can't remember it, remember it, but I do remember like the, just how enthusiastic they were, how passionate about their work, and it was a surprise in some ways that they never got the uh, the larger stage. And I think that comes down to one ill-advised tweet nine yeah. years ago. So I think there's a lesson for the younger wrestlers, like when in doubt, you know, feel it out. Because I think you can say that's the only reason that those guys oh, were not sure. in WWE, because they were characters. Yes. In addition to you know, being in amazing in-ring workers, yes. and I saw them from the front row at Rick's last match, um, that they, they worked with a who's who of the big, some of the biggest stars. And to show you how highly thought they were, not that you can ever express your, your value on someone by your contribution to a fundraiser, but typically, like, when you kick in $1,000, that's on the high end of what, you know, his co-wor- you know, co-workers do. And Jericho contributed $15,000. Yes. Kevin Owens, like 10. There were a number of people that donated really sizable amounts of money. I don't care how much money you're making, 15 grand, 10 grand, that's a lot of money. And these guys had no hesitation because they thought so highly of both Jay and his brother. I thought these guys, uh, you know, they could work with anybody. That's the thing. They could work any style. When they'd go to Japan, you know they're going to have a good match. Oh, yeah. I was actually Googling, trying to find which of the Briscoes dropped the elbow off the ring apron. Do you know which one it was? Mark. Mark. Because uh, hey, that's froggy a, bow off the that's top. A, that's a yeah. better. That's a better elbow than I dropped. I right. wish it wasn't. Maybe I had one or two that were in that category. But he was a better athlete, doing something, you know, that looked really impressive, but would be even more impressive with added athleticism. And I always knew that. And that's the guy who ended up doing the better flying elbow than I did. I also saw, you know, they had a, a wanted shirt. Yes. And I'm not sure I ever spoke about it. I know the way I felt about it. And the way I felt about it was, hey, these guys have worked so hard. They're among many who have given more to the business and the business has given back to them. If they can make some money on a shirt, you know, that, that, uh, that was similar to mine, that's no issue for me. You know, that's no problem at all. I have way more of an issue with bootleg shirts, right? you know, than I do of something that could be considered a, a little homage. bit. Of, yeah, yeah, an homage. But these guys were tremendous workers. Uh, I, like I said, I didn't get to know them very well on a personal level. Last time I spent any time with them was at the... Uh, uh, the Moxley Nick Gage match, okay. where we just had one of those small dress rooms. It was just, uh, uh, I think it was the four of us: Briscoe's, me, and Effie. You know, so that's, uh, that's those are some <laughs> disparate personalities in there. But I always had the deepest admiration for them as workers, and it seems to me like uh, they had the deep the respect of their colleagues. Uh, and um, man, I, I, my prayers go out to those two girls, Yes. so even if people are looking at the amount raised and saying, well, that's incredible, but keep in mind that the the father, you know, the bread winner has been taken from them. The girls might face substantial and lengthy medical challenges, and so I do encourage people, uh, whether they knew Jay uh, or not, 
uh, whether you know they were big advocates of his work or not, you know, to kick in a little something because it all adds up. It does add up. We'll throw up that link again here if you're so inclined to uh, to make a donation. Well, one last thing before we jump into our topic. I know we filibustered a lot, but I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> Who do you think wins the Rumble this Saturday? Barring a surprise visit by Steve or Dwayne, I'm going with Cody. I'm going with Cody, too. Yeah. The Rumble, it's such a fun event. Uh, with the, you know, there were a, there were a few years where people were really down about the um, the outcome, uh, and I did write a, a, a an article a few years ago warning WWE that they might be on the verge of it becoming just another show, but whether that whether that was a, a you know a real warning I mean, like a warning with some substance to it or not, uh, they've turned it around and they've made the Rumble a great deal of fun. We know going in that even though there's 30 people, there's five or six people who could win. Yes. But it's that amazing suspension of disbelief. I think by and large, uh, WWE does a really good job of uh, creating something special with both the men and women. And uh, I'm picking Cody to win. So we, were, we recall back in Philadelphia a handful of years ago when Roman won, yeah. the crowd really wanted Daniel Bryan to win. I guess the question is, if you're WWE, do you even risk that by putting Sammy in the Rumble, or do you keep him out of the match? Ooh, ooh. Because I wonder if Cody wins and fans see Sammy and get excited, well, do you I think split the audience? There's so much you can do with Sammy in the Rumble. Yes. Uh, with the pieces uh, revolving around him. Uh, Ricky, you know, the... the Solo and the Usos. I think there's quite a bit you can do there. I'm, I, I, I would love to see Sammy. I remember that rumble in Philadelphia because uh, three of my children were going and a snowstorm was threatening to come in. And I had a lot more experience driving in inclement weather than uh, my oldest son does. So I drove them there. Uh, we dined at Victor's in Philadelphia, which was Adrian's in the Rocky Balboa movie. Okay. Uh, so that was a good experience. And basically, I was dropping my kids off at the Rumble and then picking them up. And when I went to pick them up, I didn't need to know who won to know that fans weren't happy. Yeah. Because I could read it in the body language, people walking with their heads down, kind of like kicking at the ground. And uh, I don't think we're going to get something like that. Oh, no chance. Uh, this year. I'd love to see, uh, you know, I'm still a huge uh, Ripley fan. I'd love to see her win the women's yes. rumble because she's been doing it. W, a run in WWE is a marathon, not a sprint. Yes. And, man, this has been a nice leg of that race, you know, um, with her in Judgment Day. Uh, but I think it's uh, time for uh, a revision of a top, He'll push, and uh, so I'd like to see her uh, win that thing. I'd li- I'd love to see her and uh, uh, Bianca or Charlotte? Bianca, Bianca. Either one would be a great would be yeah. a great fit. I think we've seen Charlotte and uh, Rhea before at WrestleMania, so maybe it we is. We did, but that Bianca was empty ever. arena. Not the same. And that was one where I really thought Rhea needed the win more than yeah. Charlotte did. Um, and I don't. And it took her a while to get her momentum back. Uh, so if she did, uh, it's a different type of Rhea now. Uh, it would be a great, I think either one's a great matchup. So I'm looking forward to both of them. And I think it's safe to say that the women have done an amazing job in their rumbles, uh, since they started. And it really makes for a great show when you know you have these two, uh, you can almost count on them being epic. And then we just need a few good matches in between to make it a great, uh, it's no longer a PPV, right? No, it's a premium live event. Premium live event. PLE. There you go. Well, uh, maybe it's time for a PLE at your house, and maybe you don't want another man to enter every 90 seconds. That's why you need Blue Chew. I don't know where I was going with that, another man to enter every 90 seconds. I'm trying things every now and again, you know? <laughs> I like where you're going, though. <laughs> uh, here's the deal. Blue Chew, you already know, is like a hot, hot tag, tag for your wiener. wiener. It's a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. And you can take them anytime, day or night. 
So plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises every 90 seconds. Uh, the process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and of course, once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part, it's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversation, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. BlueChew's tablets are made right here in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. But Mick, as you know, there won't be anything, anything discreet, discreet about, about your, your package. package. Come on now. You can benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform. So let's chew it and do it. Have some better sex, y'all. We've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code Foley at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com. The promo code is Foley to receive your first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. We want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring today's podcast, which we're finally here for. We're talking about the Royal Rumble 2000. So many twists and turns. This is uh, maybe my favorite match of yours of your career. Where does it rank for you all time? Me and Triple H? Yes, sir. Top five for sure. Wow. So, yeah, top five for sure. I think I ranked it in the in uh, Foley's Good, probably at number three, somewhere around there. Ah, oh, man, it was... Uh, ah, I, I'm not just saying this because Triple H is in charge, because I've said this before. He's a great ring general, and yes. that was... A time when uh, I had uh, Vince and I had decided that I was retiring in October. Um, I my knees were shot, you know, and I'd been leading with my head when my body slowed down, and that was having an effect. And uh, when I explained that to Vince, he said, "You you just had your last match. That was a match with me and Al against uh, the Hollies, uh, Crash and Bob." And then Steve was injured. Steve hurt his neck, and we pulled together like uh, as a team and decided to have this one uh, last run. And so Triple H was operating with somebody in me. Who, you know, my uh, self-confidence had been eroded a little bit. I did on my, you know, my part, I did my part to get into much better shape. I had about six or seven weeks. I dropped a bunch of weight, got into much better cardio shape, but I still needed somebody to push me. And that's uh, what Triple H does. Uh, so I was on friendly ground. I'll be the first to admit, Taz got a better reaction that night coming out Huge. than I did. Huge. So I think that was a uh, a dropped ball for WWE in their history. Uh, but the, everything seemed to go right. You know, everything was there for us that night. It's at the Garden, which is always special for anyone, but especially me having attended so many matches there when I was younger. And just a great, I just thought it was really, it was really good storytelling and uh, Triple H and I playing, you know, playing our roles really well. Stephanie added a, a great deal to it. And it was, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I lost cleanly, uh, but got more over in the process. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm going to challenge anybody, uh, and we'll talk about this on social, of course. Can, can anybody even think of a better Rumble match that was a non-Rumble match out of Rumble? Like, I think this is probably the very best one. So why not go relive it today? I do want to talk about Taz since she brought it up. But first, I want to circle back and talk about that meeting that you had with Vince. You wrote in your book that it was November 2nd. It's mm -hmm. a SmackDown in Philadelphia. Uh, you had won the tag titles from the Hollies. But you expressed to Vince, hey, I want to talk to you after the taping is over. And as you sort of break down and say, uh, Vince, I think it's time I stop being an active wrestler. You go back and forth and you're talking about how you're having trouble playing soccer with your kids and you're feeling like your physical quality of life was poor. But when he told him of the mental problems, he sort of cut you off mid-sentence. Mm -hmm. Did you expect it to be that abrupt? Did you think it would be more of a sales job? What was your expectation? No, I, that did, I did expect, I, I expected to meet some hesitation. And there was hesitation when it was about the knees. You know, I, I couldn't play soccer with my kids because I realized that unless they kicked it right to me, my lateral movement was shot. And I think I've said on the show, one of my biggest regrets is that although I felt like I needed to be 280 when I faced Undertaker, and I think I did my best work at around 280. I had I'd gotten up to almost 320 when I was in WCW, dropped 40 pounds, and, and I think it really showed in the work I did for ECW and uh, Japan. So 280 was a good weight for me. But when I got over, you know, really over, I could have gone down to 250 and saved my knees a world of uh, pressure. And instead, knowing that I was 
he was like, you're going to be over it anyway. And we've seen that. Yes. With guys who have great physique. Not that I had a great physique and it, it faded. I'm talking about guys who have had great physiques. And as they get over, they don't have to be as razor sharp. Yes. Because they're over. So if I had gone down 30 pounds to 250 instead of going up 30 pounds to 310, uh, it would have been a different ball game. But like I said, when my body started falling apart, because I went from people saying, like, how does he get around? Like, I didn't even wear knee pads for most of my WWE run, you know? Right. And I was always, even in those wild brawls outside, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm dropping on my knees, even if it's just on the floor, you know, uh, doing a lot of damage to the point where when I had my knees, um, and I think I wrote about this in one of the t first two books, when I had my knees looked at by an orthopedic surgeon, like he gathered all his colleagues around to marvel at this 34 year old man who had 80 year old knees because there were so many little tiny fractures, you know, uh, and cracks in the kneecap. Uh, they'd never seen anything like it. Um, so I went from somebody who was holding up remarkably well to a guy who could barely walk within a year. And so then I started leading with my head without the hand up, you know, and that was like, uh, you know, that was a, I don't, I don't know if it was a macho thing or I just thought they looked better. I justified right. it. And I did block things that came in sideways and did a really good job of blocking them. But um, the tendency to lead with my head was resulting in a little bit of memory loss way back before people were really talking about it. And that's when Vince said, you just had your last match. And I, I do remember... Um, you know, there was that big lawsuit against WWE for the concussions. Um, I thought some of it was really frivolous. You know, like guys who wrestled one or two years out of a 20-year career now blaming WWE for, you know, I just... Cash grab. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think Bob Cook likened it to a guy who eats donuts every day at a variety of different donut stores but decides to sue Duncan. Yes. You know, because they're the biggest. Um and that's, so that surprised me. I think that was pretty telling, along with Vince telling me after the sell, you know, you have no idea how much I appreciate what you've just done to this company, but I never want to see anything like that again. Um, so I thought that was pretty telling about Vince looking out for the health yeah. of one of his guys. And I was making the company a lot of money. I was making a lot of money. And so, um, you know, to, to retire at 34 was a pretty big decision and then of course to come back and uh you know way too many times uh but a few of those comebacks were effective you know? let, me, let me ask when you are going to have this conversation with vince is it something you discuss with colette ahead of time like yeah yeah it was and uh, uh i yeah i do i got emotional and I remember Al Snow, you know, Al and I would always needle each other. Sure. And that day he was needling me and he saw I wasn't needling back. And he's like, are you okay? And I was like, you know, I like had tears in my eyes. I was like, Al, I, I'm, I'm going to retire. And he was waiting for like the, the punchline. The punch there was no punchline. So it sounds funny now that I'm talking about <laughs> 1999. Uh, when I, like I said, I did come back a number of times uh, with... <laughs> with less and less effectiveness over time. But, I mean, four years away, which is what it was, 2000, 2004, that is a lifetime in wrestling, right? Yes. That is a lifetime. So uh, I did go four years without a match, so I'm kind of proud of that. I, uh, I want to remind you in your book, you wrote, I was a little stunned. I'd actually been thinking of a Royal Rumble send-off at Madison Square Garden in January and told him so. Why risk it, Vince asked. If you finish tonight, you can go out as a champion, and you deserve that. Uh, you did talk things back and forth, and you settle on Survivor Series in Detroit, November 19th. That's going to be your final day, 12 more days to go. And then, of course, it doesn't really work out that way. Because of Steve's injury. Yes. So there was definitely a com camaraderie and a feeling of uh, family and teamwork. So, uh, and, this, I, and I did, I mean, I, I mentioned that at a Garden House show, Vince turned to me he didn't think show was getting it done at that time on top of the card now obviously big shows went on to have a first ballot hall of fame career if there is such a thing as first ballot uh but this guy's a huge star but in 99 it was thought that maybe he wasn't where vince wanted him to be 
in fairness to Big Show, he had had so much stuff thrown at him by so many different people that yeah, I think we broke something that wa- we tried to fix something that wasn't broken. Yes, well said. You know, and I think you can fault uh, going all the way back to the decision to put him in Austin on Raw uh, and and have Big Show lose in what was his first. Maybe his first or second match. Yeah, that was questionable to me even at the time. The the thought process was by a year a year from now, no one's going to remember that. But I think people do remember that. Um, but that was what gave me and Hunter the avenue to work on top. So before we get there, I just want to talk about the Survivor Series conversation. Uh, you wrote in your book that you you have a sit down with Jim Ross, and he lays out that they think maybe Steve Austin's career could be over. Mm-hmm. And you even write, from an ego standpoint, not a whole lot of people were going to care about Mick Foley's retirement if it coincided with Steve Austin's. Yep. And he would even say that a year earlier, Terry Funk gave you some pretty deep knowledge here. The fans sure do love us, but they don't miss us when we're gone. And that maybe is in the back of your mind thinking, hey, I want to prove Funk wrong. I want people to miss me. But, man, I don't want to retire at the same time as Steve you kind of want your moment in the sun if that's what's going to happen, right? Yeah, a little bit. And I'll say that no one could have predicted to me that I'd be going to San Antonio 20, no. <laughs> 24 years later. No. Right? <laughs> um, when Vince told me that I, I would be I'd be making a living for the next 10 years off of what I'd done in WWE, I thought that was a stretch. I thought I had about an 18-month shelf life. Not that I'd be completely forgotten, but I, I wouldn't be relevant anymore. I'm so glad that that has proven not to be the case. Right. And it is, like I said, stunning that these all these many decades later, you know, we do we do better on the you know these shows than we did when you know. Absolutely, it's incredible. Thank you, fans, for making that possible. Thank you, Funko, because those pops are a phenomenon. Oh my goodness. Bigger every year. It yeah, seems. that's the secret ingredient. Crossing my fingers for the rumored Undertaker Mankind two pack. Oh, hi now. Yeah. Just in time for a special anniversary coming exactly. up too. You wrote in your book that um, you're you're thinking at the time. All right, maybe it'll be my last match will be in December uh, at Armageddon in Fort Lauderdale against The Rock, which would have been Babyface versus Babyface. Yeah. On the way there, you do drop the tag titles to the New Age Outlaws. You manage to dislocate your shoulder in the process. Coming out of Survivor Series, Big Show is the champ. Uh, It looks like maybe they're going to start trying to get behind him. But as you said, maybe it's a bit of a struggle at this point. And at some point, it comes to be that The Rock is going to be in line for the title at WrestleMania. And you write, I called Hunter aside on November 29th in Los Angeles and told him my plans. His eyes lit up. Together we planned and plotted and pulled Vince aside to tell him about our big idea, and he shot it down. I honestly don't remember why or what even was said, but I do remember feeling the agony of defeat as I left the office. I like the idea of you pitching this and then getting shot down, and then somehow you're going to get there. Mm -hmm. Talk me through this process and... You know, the reason reason this fascinates me more than anything is we hear in more recent years when Vince was there as a regular contributor on a day-to-day part or a day-to-day role, it's hard for guys to even get FaceTime, but it feels like you guys have just a different relationship in that era, or is it just your personal relationship? And maybe that still exists with different talent today. I I think Vince still does have the close relationships with uh, a handful of the top guys. Um, I mean, I tried to reach out to Vince uh, over the holidays, and his number had changed. Uh, but there are people who've seen him. I think Cena had seen him, and that uh, this is before any of us knew he's going to be back in the mix. I think Undertaker had seen him, so his phone was always open for those type of people. I remember Kevin Dunn saying, like, you know, Vince wants you to call him. Yeah, you know, he said he's got that relationship with Rock and Steve and uh, you know Undertaker and guys that he help thinks help make this company. He doesn't have that with you. I was like, really? And I, that surprised me. Yeah. And so I texted him. I said, "Do you want to talk?" Uh, and we had a nice talk. Um, and then I was back in in the fold. 
Um, I don't remember exactly the the angle I pitch, pitched. pitched well, you, you were Vince. pitching Hunter and and you at the rumble. Yeah, and then I think while you're saying that, it must have been a case where we shot we were shot down. And then he came up to us at that house show and he said and he accepted that idea. Probably put a couple twists on it. Do you think Vince just loved what you had done with Rock and felt like that should be the swan song still? I, so I don't. Than- I no. I I think it really had to do with needing to bridge that gap between um, Steve's injury and mania, clearly knowing that Rock was going to be, uh, you know, the a major part of mania. Uh, but I, I think they needed something to bridge that gap, and maybe he didn't want to go with me and Rock for that reason because we had such great history together. You pitch him another idea, December 4th at a house show in Madison Square Garden. He shoots it down again, and you wrote, I was frustrated as hell. I knew deep down that I had at least one good match left in me and hated Vince for not allowing me to have it. Hated him. Why Vince? Whoa. Why? His answer hurt me perhaps worse than any chair shot I've ever received. <laughs> but at the same time, it opened up my eyes to the logic of his answer, which made hatred a great deal more difficult to feel. Mick, you're huge. I tried to defend myself, but with a body that seemed to support his accusation, I was left speechless. He continued to assault, but did so as gently as possible. Maybe you two could have a good match at the Rumble if we promoted it correctly, but a rematch in February would require you to put in a lot of time, and he was referring to the length of the match. Quote, I don't think you can really do it. Uh, wow. Challenging yeah, true. here. True. True. Speaking of challenges, in two weeks when I return to the studio, we're going to begin the Foley Weight Loss Challenge. This is the heaviest I've ever been. In truth, uh, my weight is a little bit of the reason I didn't go on the show. Because I'm about 60 pounds heavier than I was just from the last time people saw me. And about 80 pounds heavier than I was when I refereed uh, a cell match with Roman and Braun. And I think I I need to drop about, for my own health, 50, 60 pounds. And uh, that would be part of the reason why traveling for this project that I've been doing the last several months has been just... It's been re- it's been much more difficult than it needs to be, partially because I'm just too big. So two weeks from now, we're gonna weigh in. We'll have to figure out a way to make it fun, get people behind me. I love but it. I don't think I can do it without the pressure of accountability. Accountability. So Vince, speaking of accountability, you know, that lit a fire under my butt, big time. I was lucky that I know it sounds ridiculous to say I owned a gym, but my wife and I owned a gym in the Florida Panhandle. So I was lucky that I could go there after hours, and I did. I worked really hard on the cardio. You know, I I was kind of giving up on the upper musculature type of thing, but I was definitely putting the time and effort into the cardio, and I think it showed. Oh, absolutely. Dropped about 30 big ones in six, seven weeks. I was moving noticeably better, and uh, the proof, as they say, was in the pudding. And then, magically, Vince approaches you. Mick, can I talk to you? I'm not going with Triple H and show at the Rumble. The reaction's just not there. I'm going with you and Hunter, but not as a retirement match. We can do that later. But, Mick, I want you to get in shape. I had six weeks to get there, and as you laid out, you certainly did. Uh, It's pretty cool to see that you were campaigning for this. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. You were persistent. No, no, no. And then finally he acquiesces. Sure did. Good Uh, word. Unfortunately... It's maybe because Big Show wasn't getting over with the crowd at the time. Maybe the creative wasn't great. and That's what the thought was. Yes. Um, and, and look, <laughs> this is a little segue. Chris Jericho and I once killed three hours on a plane trip discussing Big Show's heel and face changes, turns. And it was 20 years ago. Yes. Like That's how many times Show had turned. So I don't know if it was the turning, uh, because he did have some really effective turns. He had some crappy creative. Yeah, but he also had some great stuff along the way. The elephant gun. I mean, they had a lot of, they had a lot of great things that Show did. Uh, But he did. He turned quite a bit. Whatever the reason, I was given the green light after Vince saw uh, what he needed to see at that house show. Through the course of this, we also see Stephanie uh, turn on her father and join. Triple H, so it's like uh, the McMahon-Helmsley regime really begins here. I don't think anybody would have predicted, or I certainly would have, that Stephanie would go on to be such a great on-screen character 
And I realized some of our listeners hated her. Well, guys, that was the idea. She was a heel. And my goodness, she was phenomenal as a heel, right? Such a great, yeah, great character. Uh, if I may say my one contribution during that time is I think the idea was, in Stephanie's explanation, it was a swerve all along. I told her I thought there was more heat in saying that Hunter turned her on. You know, like... She came to this by accident, but he, and I, there's that line, he really turns me on, which I thought was more heat than saying that she'd been planning it, an elaborate ruse all along. Uh, but whatever the case, Stephanie's one of my favorite yes. characters, really is, and she's such a professional. Really, her memorization process and her work ethic is just incredible. She was so helpful to me when I was a GM because I was I was just I would blank out, you know, I couldn't remember a lot of the verbiage, and she'd always have a few. Uh, I remember uh, Carlos, uh, well, Carlos the announcer, Cabrera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carlos comes over to me. He says, "Did Stephanie say five alarm flyer to you?" I said, "Yes, she did." I went up to Stephanie before my premiere, before our premiere segment uh, as uh, commissioner and GM. I said, Stephanie, I'm going to forget what I'm saying. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. So if you could be standing by with like a couple of key words. What I didn't know is I would space out like eight seconds into my own promo. And so you actually, if you watch, you can see Stephanie like walk by or at least in proximity and go, five alarm fire. And then that put me back on uh, course. So I thought she was a, I, I really thought she was a great character. I really enjoyed working with her in 2000 and in 2016, 2017. Uh, can't say enough nice things about Stephanie. We want to talk about uh, another segment you had on the way to this Royal Rumble. You wind up working a boiler room match with Santa. <laughs> That to me is is something that has this is to one be. where I got attacked. Yeah, uh, the real Santa was there, and then I was attacked by uh, several faux Santas who were the Mean Street Posse. Right? How hilarious is this? And I think Billy Gunn and Road Dog were. Uh, there were a couple of different uh, Santa matches I had. I, I can't remember which one was which, but uh, yeah, that was the last uh, Santa was Triple H. He's going to clobber you, lay you out. And uh, Christmas music is playing, and Teddy Long sort of deadpans and raises Triple H's arm outside of the boiler room and announces that Santa Claus was the winner. <laughs> I don't know why, but just the idea that Mick Foley's wrestling Santa Claus in a boiler room match <laughs> still tickles me to this day. Um, let's talk a little bit about beach balls. Uh, you're going to have a no contest uh, with Big Show and uh, Stephanie's doing color, and the crowd is kind of dead for the match because they're entertaining themselves with a beach ball in the crowd. And I know this became a hot topic, I don't know, maybe eight or nine years ago, and some of the wrestlers took great issue with it. Others didn't care at all. I think specifically maybe the most egregious one was the night after at WrestleMania. It was a really rowdy crowd, and I think Sheamus maybe was in the ring and uh, I, I'm just curious from your perspective, where are you at on beach balls and the fans just entertaining themselves <laughs> and sort of ignoring what's happening in the ring? Well, we're all there to enjoy what's happening in the ring. Yes. So beach balls, a distraction. It's kind of disrespectful. Yeah. Huh? And it has, you know, every time if the fans feel like they need to entertain themselves or if, if they make the decision to follow a beach ball rather than the product they paid to see, I guess that could be, uh, telling about what they're seeing in the ring, but I'd like to think it wasn't so much <laughs> me and uh, uh, Big Show, as it is a, a bug is going to fly into that light yes. no matter what, right? Uh, so people are in inquisitive by nature, and I think no matter what the event is, you put a beach ball into the air, uh, people are going to follow it. Let's talk a little bit about the pink slip on a pole match. It's going down in Greensboro. Raw's going to open with DX and Stephanie in the ring, and you're going to try to turn DX on Hunter by using mind games. Stephanie then announces that you're going to take on The Rock in a pink slip on a pole match. Ultimately, uh, Rock gets the win. You lose in six minutes and ten seconds. And uh, afterwards, you take off your mask and do a farewell interview, which Meltzer would say is too bad. Because when it's time to do the real one, he's now <laughs> trivialized it. 
<laughs> it was a good interview, even if it was played as a comedy backdrop for Triple H to make fun of him. What do you think of that creative then for you to do like a, a faux farewell? And do you agree now with hindsight that Meltzer thought maybe that wasn't the best call? Well, you know, I, I'm glad I wasn't uh, reading. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> we, we covered that with dude love and things of that nature. I don't think it trivial. It may have seemed at the time like it was going to trivialize it, but I think we followed that up with the uh, I've been fired, right? The, all the vignettes with Triple H and uh, Dennis Knight in the role of the uh, fake mankind, I thought were really effective. So I think if I had not given given a, an interview like I had, like I was retiring, that there would not have been that, uh, you know, four or five week block that was really strong that built up to what I thought was going to be the last match. And I did not know for a fact that I was going to get a retirement speech. Right. Up until I think the decision was made to do the uh, um, uh, loser must retire based on an injury. Was Eddie Guerrero injured at that point? I don't recall. I can't remember, but I think uh, uh, I don't remember what the mindset was going into that. Um, but no, I, I, I'm going to respectfully disagree and say, uh, as we did, I already say the proof is in the pudding. Yes. Right. We came out with um, the end justifies the means. Yes. Some of the time, and in this case, uh, we had two really great matches, and I don't think anyone. I didn't even recall that I gave a very well. Speech. Yeah. yeah. Well, you do uh, some interviews here on SmackDown with Jim Ross, where you're talking about being back at home. And you mentioned in your interview that you wanted to leave on your own terms and you never got to headline a WrestleMania. I think that's fascinating, especially in hindsight, to think about. Of course, we know it's going to happen for you, but I'm curious, was that a bucket list item for you that you... It it didn't become a bucket list item until that run, you know, the, the run with The Rock and then the later the run with Hunter. Because I think I'd set a list of goals, and my goal was to headline a pay-per-view that did uh, whatever the rating was going to be, to headline a house show that sold out Madison Square Garden. So I don't think I ever put the emphasis on WrestleMania, and I even to this day, I encourage, you know, I tell people, like, you get to define in life what your own WrestleMania moments are, whether right. you're a wrestler or not. Like, you get to decide what the important moments in your life are not to go all DDP on you yeah. at this point. Uh, but I can be positive when I need to. And I think it's important that we uh, have that ability to not let someone else define for us what being a success is. So if I did say, if I did feel that way about mania, that was a late feeling because now it was on the horizon. Maybe a year or two earlier, that wouldn't have seemed uh, a possibility. Because I, you know, I took a lot of pride in being the guy who gets the real guy ready, to being the guy who gets the top guy ready for uh, for Mania. But here it was in my grasp. At one point, Mania was going to be me, Steve, and Dwayne in a three-way, and uh, you know that got shot down. Um, there was a, a a promo I did. I think it's been lost to the hands of time. Um, after I lost the uh, uh, the pink slip match. Kevin Kelly did an interview and I broke into tears. I really did, legit, because I've never been able to pretend to cry, even when I've tried. Um, but in that case, I broke into tears. My wife and the two kids, you know, when I had two kids, they were there. And I think Vince saw that promo and realized how important it was to me. Wow. And jumping ahead uh, to Mania 2000, that's why they decided to make it a, uh, a four way. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, let's talk about the next Raw at Miami. We're going to see uh, The Rock be put in a handicap match where if he loses, he'll be fired, and uh, he's going to have to take on um, X-Pac and Hunter. And you come out and make the save, yes. uh, and you're bouncing chair shots off of both guys, and you write, I was firing chair shots so quickly that I didn't have time to line up for X-Pac correctly, and I knew when he went down that I'd caught him with the edge of the chair, which is a definite no-no. I waited for him to come through the curtain, and sure enough, when he did, the skin on his forehead looked like a tin of sardines that had been opened <laughs> a third of the way. He took it amazingly well, but it sure did look good on tape. Uh, man, how great is Sean Waltman? Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Up until a few years ago, when I, I, I still thought, I'm not saying he doesn't have a run left in him. I don't think he thinks he has a run left in he him. He does. You think so? He's got a couple At this matches point, in him. 
Uh, but when I saw him at the gathering of the Juggalos, I was just surprised by how sharp he was and how great. much he looked like his uh, former self in the ring. And he's just been a great, uh, he, he's not just a superstar, but a great ambassador, you know, for wrestling. And a Agreed. guy going back all the way back to that incredible victory over Razor that put him on the map, which was one of the great moments in Raw and was shown uh, as part of the highlight package. So that yeah yeah he's been he's been really great. Let's talk a little bit about uh, that return. Of course, you took the mask off, so maybe that was symbolic that okay, mankind. Can, can I just go back to Sean Waltman sure. uh, for a second? Because I, I don't know if you saw the photo. I ran into uh, uh, Drew McIntyre oh, yeah. and Sheamus on the airplane, and so I'm sitting one seat in in back of Drew. And we're talking before the flight takes off, but we're talking steadily. And the guy next to me kind of reads the writing on the wall. He goes, would you two like to sit together? Uh, yeah, sure. So Drew and I end up talking the whole time. And uh, he brought up that when he and Brock first got together, Brock was like, and this shows you the wisdom of Brock Lesnar. He's like, you have to stop bumping for everyone because you get caught up in that idea of having a great match every time. And you forget that you're trying to build a character at the same time. And one way of doing that is through having great matches. But the type of match you have sometimes depends on who you're facing. And so I told him about this time with Sean Waltman where we were getting together uh, before the uh, retirement match, before the Hell in a Cell. And Sean wants to tear the house down. And I was like, Sean, I said, I know we could do that but I feel like I need to look strong. And that was a, it was a, ten, you know, tension, but you have to have those talks sometimes for the good of the program. And it was a little, it wasn't the type of match that Sean wanted to have, but it was the type of match I thought we needed to have. Yeah. And I think that big fans of, of what we do hopefully can open their minds to the idea that there is a time and a place yes. to uh, take one for the team and have less than the best match you can have because it's better for the pro the, the bigger story. Yeah, bigger picture, yeah. Hey guys, I'm pumped to brag about a brand new sponsor here on the program and is a personal friend of mine for many, many years. I'm talking to you about Camper Max, specializing in max discounted pricing on travel trailers and fifth wheel RVs that can be delivered anywhere in the lower 48. That's right, from your office, your cell phone, or your couch, Click or call and find out how easy it is to start enjoying that RVing lifestyle. Now, how easy is it? Well, the Camper Max discount will fit any budget, offering easy financing with extended terms. It's just too easy, thanks to my pal, Rod Wagner. I've been personal friends with Rod for a long, long time, and he is now opening up to the entire lower 48. So if you're here in the United States and you're thinking about buying a travel trailer, you're thinking about buying a fifth wheel RV, or maybe you're thinking of selling yours, visit my buddy Rod at CamperMax.com. That's C-A-M-P-E-R-M-A-X-X.com. CamperMax.com. That's Max with two X's. Or give him a call, 256-320-7033. Either way, let the folks at Camper Max know that Conrad sent you and they're going to give you that friend of a friend hookup that I've enjoyed for oh so many years. Camper Max is the home of the Max discount. That's CamperMax.com. Camper, M-A-X-X.com. By the way, if you're looking to purchase a motorhome, hang in there. My buddy Rod is working on that now. It's all going down at CamperMax.com. Let's get out there. Let's enjoy 2023. This could be one heck of a new year. Thanks to CamperMax.com or 256-320-7033, and let them know that Conrad sent you. Yeah. Um, one of the other things I wanted to ask about is the idea that this Rumble match isn't going to be against Hunter against Mick Foley or Hunter against Dude Love or Hunter against Mankind. It's Hunter against Cactus Jack. Yeah. In your mind, when you took the mask off and did the little farewell speech that you don't even remember now, but... In that moment, did you know then it's going to be Cactus Jack at MSG? I don't know, Conrad, to tell you the truth. But as you bring that up, and as we're fond of saying, we're about creating moments. I mean, I'd like to think the second that Dave saw the the promo where Mankind becomes Cactus Jack, that yes. it all 
made sense. And I was told by this brilliant illusionist named Matt Ricardo from the UK that that's the segment he shows people who are not fans that opens their eyes to the possibility. Because for those of our listeners and viewers, of which there probably aren't that many, because I think most people are familiar with this promo, it's essentially me changing my shirt. Right. And I've given credit to Triple H uh, every chance I can because it's so important that all he needed to do was go, <laughs> you're the same guy with a different shirt. Yes. And instead he sold it's it. Now, huge. as we approach this, I realize that once I say the line, I'm not re- once I say I'm not ready to, you know, mankind, mankind's a heck of a fighter, but he's not ready to take you on. But I know somebody who is. I realize I've got a small window of time before the fans start chanting The Rock's name. So I've got to cut to the chase wow. pretty quickly. That's in my head, and I think that would have been borne out if I'd waited even five more seconds. Mm. And instead, as soon as I start taking that thing off, and it's got the blood spattered from the week before, and man, that, cl- that crowd just came unglued. Yeah. And it became this, I mean, it became one of the best things I've ever done. And like I said, something that... Some big time fans show their non wrestling friends, and it kind of, even if it doesn't turn them into a fan, it opens their eyes to like our. I, I consider what we do to be an art form. Yeah. And it opens their eyes as to uh, the artistry involved. Triple H, that is enough. We saw a vicious side of Mick Foley Monday night after being driven through the table. Is this what you get off on? Making fun of me? How much more do you want from me? First, you take away my job. Then you bring this idiot out there and you take away my dignity. Then Monday night, in what should have been the greatest night of my life when I was reinstated on Roy's war. You take me and you ruin my shirt. What? And you ruin my face. And I'll be honest, when I stepped into that shower and I let the cold water run down on my head and I looked down at the blood as it swirled around that shower drain, I started thinking a little bit about what mankind was. Now, mankind is an entertaining son of a gun. Mankind is a pretty damn good author. Mankind is one top SOB. And mankind is one hell of a fighter. So it saddens me to say that after the beating you gave me on Monday night, one thing mankind is not is ready to face you in a street fight at the Royal Rumble in Madison Square Garden. Is that? Because you are without a doubt the game. You are the best in the business right now. And as you said, well, mankind in some ways is nothing more than a beaten up, pathetic fool. But I think the WWF fans deserve a substitute in that match. A substitute? He's chicken it out. What I'm going to do, Triple H, is I'm going to name him right now. As a matter of fact, I think you know the guy. Uh oh. Oh, no. Uh, no, no, no. And I think you know him pretty damn well. His name is Cactus Jack. Act 
as part of the WWF is to kick your teeth all over the city of Chicago. Cactus Jack is back! Cactus Jack is back and he's he a dangerous on. human being! Cactus Jack after Triple H! And here we go! Cactus Jack hammered away on the WWF champion! Get out of there, game! Mick Foley is more vicious, more dangerous than ever, King! some news for you. It will not be the first time. And it sure as hell will not be the last because I've got an awful lot of blood to give. That's a scary thought. But as far as you, you look into my eyes and realize I mean every word when I tell you I'm going to tear you apart in New York City. And then I will take what you hold dearest. I'm talking about your cherished WWF championship belt. I will take it and it will be mine. Mine! Oh my! Bye bye! He's sick! He's deranged! Does Triple H have any idea what he's getting himself into in 10 days at the Royal Rumble? It's now Cactus Jack, Triple H, with a World Wrestling Federation Championship on the line! The metamorphosis is complete! Cactus Jack is back! This is bad! It's amazing how the subtleties in wrestling make all the difference. Yeah. You know, I don't know that it ever really clicked for me until you said it. Really, I was just changing my shirt. Um, but you do this voice effect, too, and those little subtleties. And even comparing Hulk Hogan, who had this incredible run and became an icon in the red and yellow, he changes his colors oh. and dyes his beard and has slightly different mannerisms. But, man, it works so well. Incre incredible. And now I was a guy at home. Uh, saying to myself on one level, he's playing the air guitar, his beard is different colors. Yes. This is so stupid. Yes. On the other hand, I'm admitting to myself, it's working. Yes, it is. It's working. It's amazing. He changes. He comes out to Hendrix, right? Yeah. And he's, he goes white and black for yeah. NWO. And uh, brother, it was maybe the greatest run of his career. It's just fascinating to me that I don't think we fans or maybe even folks in the business really think about the little nuances, the little subtleties and how they make all the difference. I think a lot of times when people think about reinventing a character or putting a new coat of paint on a character, it must be radically different. But just now, as we're talking in our normal everyday voices and you broke into that mankind voice, I got goosebumps. <laughs> it's a little thing that still works. Hey, you know, what's funny uh, as you were able to see my show um, in Huntsville, yeah. the last tour before COVID, right? Yes. Before COVID. As time went on, especially when I started doing the songs on Cameo, I would break out the uh, 
dude is wishing you a happy birthday. And so when I went to when I went to Australia, I was varying. I was changing the different birthday songs I right. had. And as soon as I did the My Way, which some of our viewers and listeners here have seen, uh, there was a change where I go from being dude love to mankind in about a second and a half. So that, you know, so dude finishes one line and then off goes the dude stuff, on goes the mask. I turn around and I say, yes, there were times I slipped and fell like the time I was, there were times you slipped and fell like yes. the time that I was thrown off the cell. And the crowd reacts as if they're actually seeing yes. a different guy. Yes. So on one hand, they're very aware. Yes. I'm just <laughs> a guy, an overweight dude in his late 50s, taking off one ridiculous outfit, putting on another. But on the other hand, it's like, it's a different guy. Yeah. And every, so the promoter in Australia said, that's the song you need to be doing. Yes. So for the last five nights, it was it was my way. And every night we got the reaction as if, we're seeing a change in character. It's crazy. And it reminded me of that promo I did with, with Triple H. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Well, let's talk about the next day in SmackDown. You're in Tallahassee, and it's one of the most iconic long skits in WWE history. You wrote in your book that Dennis Knight, Phineas Godwin, <laughs> and Midian uh, could do an uncanny imitation of you. You wrote, when I showed up to the arena, I received tremendous news. I was being dispatched to Universal Studios to supervise some bogus mankind vignettes. So we were not in Orlando. We were at Tallahassee, yes. and they and we drove to Orlando. Yes. And Bruce probably covered this in uh, something to wrestle with at one point, right? I'm sure. Because Bruce was hands-on. Okay, go ahead with the, the... Well, I'm just curious how this came to be, because this feels like... How does Vince... How do people know that Midian can do this? I think he'd done it enough... The, the uh, word Triple, just got Triple H certainly knew okay. that he could do it. And even though Triple H didn't have the pull then that he does now, I'm just guessing it was a Triple H suggestion, but it was really good. I mean, this was, uh, other than, uh, you know, Naked Midian premiering uh, in front of a sold-out house on the monitor, um, uh, this is, one I think, one of the finest moments of Dennis Knight's career. Uh, so... We got this promo. Boy, let me tell you, before Triple H fired me, I was somebody. I wasn't afraid of anything. I jumped off the top of the hell in a cell. The Undertaker almost killed me, but I wasn't afraid. No, do you hear me? No, I was not afraid. Because this, I am mankind, the craziest, most fearless wrestler. Is this in when history. he's on the Jaws ride? And the mechanical the shark, shark jumps up. And he lets out a whoo. <laughs> Great stuff. I I really told Dennis, and I think I insisted, we were asked what ride we wanted to utilize, and I said the Jaws ride. I thought it would lend itself best to that type of verbiage, and the lighting would be good. And I got to ride it like six, seven times, and I got to see Dennis's performance. I really told him, you have to build up multiple times that you're not afraid of anything. Yes. And then when this thing comes out, you ha I, I like to, I think I told him to play it up as much as you possibly could. And he's annoying passengers with his tales of bravery. And when that thing surfaced and he let out that shriek, <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. And then after several seconds, he regains his composure and says, boy, I'm sure not afraid of that anymore, <laughs> which is so stupid. I just and he, love it. At this time, there was no Amazon mankind mask you could order. This is Richie Posner making a mankind mask out of duct tape. Wow. And, and it looked good, too. It looked really good. Before Triple H fired me, I was somebody. I wasn't afraid of anything. I jumped off the top of the hell in the cell. The Undertaker almost killed me, but was I afraid? No. Can you hear me? No, I was not afraid because I am mankind. I am the fearless, most crazy wrestler in the entire history of professional wrestling. There isn't anything that frightens me. There isn't one thing in this entire world that I'm scared of, little mister. Do you hear me? I don't know what you people are thinking, but I'm mankind. What was that? Oh my God! Oh, 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 boy! I sure am not scared of that anymore. 
Uh, then they do the Back to the Future ride, and he says, I know. I'll set the hands of time back to December 28th, 1998. When my wife was still attracted. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, that was, uh, better yet, March 15th, 1982, the last time my wife found me attractive <laughs> and let me have sex with her. Boy, that sure was a great day. <laughs> no, my one regret is I'm, <laughs> I'm such a sp- I'm such a spoil sport in character where I would take such grave offense to that. And I was even thinking as I was, you know, uh, stomping a mud hole and walking him dry at the Back to the Future ride, that uh, that was actually pretty funny, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, that I was like, is that in keeping the character you get that upset about something that's meant in jest? But I, I think I even said in the book, like, uh, by virtue of the fact there were no other brawls in front of the Back to the Future ride, Right. That's like the Bret Hart of Back to the Future Bros, right? <laughs> the best there is, the best there was, best there ever will be. Oh, my gosh. What a great segment. Raw the next week is in St. Louis, and Dave Meltzer even says it's one of the best shows in a long time. The, uh, the whole roster came out showing The Rock as the leader, claiming they would form a rival company called the World Rock Federation or something like that in protest over Triple H and Stephanie's reign. And throughout the show, Mankind is torturing the fake Mankind <laughs> and threatened to make him watch an hour of Al Snow matches, which is fun because you can get the best of Al Snow DVD. Actually, they never uh, made that. Uh, it doesn't exist. Yeah, never made that. Uh, the main event started as DX versus uh, Rock, Mankind, and the Acolytes. And the whole show was built around DX being mad at Triple H. Um Meltzer would say, actually, it seems every show is built around that, only they make up at the end, and it's a swerve. But this week, it wasn't a swerve until the next night. So they walked out. Acolytes and Rock ended up doing the disappearing act, brawling to the back, so it wound up being Triple H versus Mankind. And this was by far the best Foley has looked in the ring Mm -hmm. since his double knee surgery. It was a dramatic, heated, three-and-a-half-star match. Uh, Of course, eventually, we do the unmasking, the bang-bang, the announcers never reference Cactus Jack, and the Bang Bang is seemingly under, only understood by a very small percentage of the crowd. What do you remember of this match? Meltzer really loved it. Were you feeling it that day? You can yeah, tell. Yeah, definitely. Unless I'm mistaken, this is the one where I'm uh, firing the. Oh no, no, it may. This may have been the one where uh, I waylaid uh, Dennis Knight. I might be off for a week. But there was definitely a time where I uh, went back to watch the video and I thought maybe it had been sped up because I was moving so much faster than I had. Yeah. And I don't know if it was that match or the following week with the angle with the revelation of, uh, of Cactus Jack, but uh, Triple H is just urging me, you know, as I'm hammering him with those forearms, he's, come on, come on, you know, he's bringing out the best of me. So as I hit Triple H with the running knee, which I'd done by that point, at least a hundred times. I mean, yeah. that's a very conservative estimate. Uh, I was moving so fast that I ended up hitting my uh, sternum, knocking the wind out of myself, and I don't know if it was a bruise or whatever. I was sore to the touch for a couple of weeks after that because I'd been moving so much faster. So yeah, you, no doubt that was the best I was moving since the uh, surgery. Uh, I think that was about six months earlier. I had the double knee surgery. I think this might be the last time you're billed as Mankind and wrestle on Monday Night Raw. Mm, I think um, you're right. And I'm curious from your perspective, we know how fond you were of Dude Love, you know, being this mythological persona you created as a kid, and then you get to play it out. Right. And then, really, Cactus Jack is just yours. But Mankind, man, you really sunk your teeth into that. And mm-hmm. this is kind of a farewell of sorts. Was it bittersweet to see that character go, or were you just glad to be done with that mask? I wasn't bittersweet to see it because it was, you know, going in a direction that I was, you know, very enthusiastic about. I don't think I paused to say, hey, this is the last time we'll see Mankind, because now you can see him on cameo.com slash Mick Foley. Not a plug, just a PSA. Not a plug, just saying it is out, the man in a Mankind mask. Yes. Um... Uh, so I loved the character. I'd really grown to love that character, but I realized, as we've spoken about in past episodes, that uh, there, there was something special about the reveal of one of the other characters, whether it's dude love giving way to mankind so that mankind could take care of business, or in this case, mankind ceding uh, ground to uh, Cactus so Cactus can take care of business. I always felt like 
not always, but when it was done right, that the characters were introduced for uh, for dramatic effect. Sure. And effect, and then that it was it was effective. Talk to me about the the same show. We have these backstage skits with Tori, uh, where you're being very complimentary of her sweaty, <laughs> heaving, voluptuous Is breasts. This- <laughs> And you're talking about, uh, I've composed a list of about 17 other things I'd really like to do to those bad boys. Uh, of course, this is just silliness. But eventually, you write in your book that Noelle asks you when her bad boys would grow. I don't think we as fans ever think about, hey, our kids are going to watch this and ask us about it. Bad boys. It bad was, boys. It was, you know, when that, when that uh, promo is taken out of context, it seems... <laughs> yeah, a little alarming, maybe. But I think the idea was, I was tr- who was I trying to get? I was saying, come into my dressing room. It's right, and I give them the, and I, uh, is it's going to be somebody else in that dressing room? I think I was arranging for someone. To you're, you're hoping, or it winds up where the bogus mankind catches the beat down. <laughs> yeah, that's yes. It. So that's yeah. the swerve. Okay, okay that's you're doing swerve. it to get him beat up. I'm, I'm saying completely inappropriate things. Things you would never say. Right. This is the Tory before Tory Wilson. Yes. Yes. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm saying these things in order to for fake man, bogus mankind to take the beat down. But like I said, taken on its own out of context, it seems wildly inappropriate, which it was. Which I don't know that you could do today, but boy, it made for entertaining TV, but I'm sure even funnier for you and Colette when she asked. No, I'll ask when her bad boys. Bad boys, boys. okay. Uh, From your book, fortunately, when the tag from Triple H uh, came from uh, Triple H in the ring, what I did was better than what I could have imagined. My first few punches were nothing special, and I put Hunter in the corner, as was my trademark, began throwing those forearms to the mm-hmm. head. I usually throw five or six, sometimes a little more. Sometimes they come in slow and deliberate, sometimes a little faster. But on this night in St. Louis, the forearms were somehow better. I started slow and picked up the pace. By the time I got to 10, the crowd was behind every one. And Hunter was sliding down and was encouraging me with everyone. Come on, Mick, come on. He said as my wrist bone connected with his skull at ever shorter intervals. By the time I was done, I had thrown 22 forearms and moved at the speed that, uh, I mean, this is something that you're sort of writing about in hindsight. You're shocked and you just sort of laid it out, but we hear, or we see in your book, he's cheering you on. Come on, Mick, come Mm -hmm. on. He noticed it too, that you had, you had found another gear. And do you attribute all of this to the cardio at the beach? Well, cardio and Triple H and uh, visualization, belief in myself. And I also want to point out, it was uh, my dear friend Brian Hildebrandt, who wrestling fans would get to know better as Mark Curtis, who saw me, he thought, you know, I had to work with a limited, you know, uh, move set. You know, I didn't have the extraordinary athleticism. I threw pretty good forearms, and Brian knew I was a big uh, fan of all Japan. Yes. And so he showed me, I I knew what Toshiaka Kawada was doing with the kicks, the fast kicks in the corner. And he suggested I do those with forearms. Wow. And that turned out to be a, a, you know, major part of my limited arsenal. I love that. Uh, But yeah, it it was, it was everything combined. It was the scenario, belief in myself, visualization, Triple H playing a big part and you throw it all together. And it was a much improved Hardcore legend. And just a few minutes later, you take the turnbuckle to the chest, bruise your sternum, really struggle to, to keep your breath. It, it feels like it's been knocked out of you. And you're going to be hurting for a while here mm-hmm. with a bruised yep. sternum. Yeah. Is that just the highs and low? I mean, this is all in the same match where you feel like, man, I'm moving faster than ever. This feels fantastic. Now I can't breathe. Now I can't yeah, breathe. Yeah. I, yeah. I was a, that was a small price to pay for the, you know, for the movement and uh, the strengthening of the angle. Um, it's a big angle. We know that we're the next night we're going to have, uh, an interview angle with triple H calling mankind out to the ring. And instead of the real deal, they bring out the bogus guy who gets down and grovels at Hunter's feet. (laughs) They're just mocking you. And then eventually you come out, big response, triple H that's enough. Uh, is this what you get off on making fun of me? You take my job. Then you bring this idiot out here and you take away my dignity this is a, a big time promo. And at this point, um, 
Russo is now with WCW. Who, if anybody, is helping you with the verbiage of a big promo? I think I had a lot of freedom there. Okay. I mean, uh, Tommy Blacha, uh, who went on to do Metal (laughs) Metal Acapulco. What is it called? (laughs) He did things, something on Adult Swim. Oh, okay. Yeah. And he was a really good writer, written for Conan O'Brien. I don't want to downplay. Great guy. I mean, yeah, great LA guy. Um, don't want to downplay his contributions, but I think I had a lot of free reign at that point to do the verbiage on my own. And, uh, of course, here's the big reveal you talked about before. I think you know the guy. The crowd starts to stir. I rip open my mankind collar shirt to reveal the infamous wanted dead shirt underneath. His name is Cactus Jack. A pop as big as I've ever been a part of. And his first official act as a part of the World Wrestling Federation is to kick your teeth all over Chicago. That is a fun little Superman reveal mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Um, the biggest pop of your career, I mean, maybe is when you win the title, and this is two, would you think? Maybe Maybe so, yeah. It's, uh, it's amazing all the little moments that get to this incredible match. And with the benefit of hindsight all these years later, it makes me wonder... You know, was it the match just on its own that made it that, or were we just all emotionally invested because of this story? Yeah, when you get emotionally invested, everything is so much more meaningful, and you kind of see what you want to see, but at the same time, I think it does hold up over time that it was a really, uh, it was a really good match. With Triple H, I think I said Triple H was on top of his game, and I wasn't far behind. I thought he was the MVP of that match, but I was uh, better than I'd been in a long time. At this point, is this the angle or promo or story you're most proud of, or where does it rank? Uh, just it the was whole so, it was it meant so much to me because I'm getting a chance to write my own exit. Yes, you know I get to ride off into the sunset um, under my own conditions, and not too many people have the chance to do that. And then, as we know, I I would come back <laughs> six weeks after that the cell match, which we'll talk about in a, another time. But yeah, this felt like one of the best things I'd ever done. And I'm so fortunate that I had the opportunity to do it. We, uh, we see that um, Hunter is going to air footage from The Rock, destroying you with all the chair shots at the prior Royal Rumble. And he's going to say, that's nothing compared right. to what he's going to do to you. And of course, you're going to vow to turn him into a human pincushion. And um, you guys start fighting. And unfortunately... You've lost so much weight, your pants start to come down. <laughs> and all the replays, they edit that off. Is this the first time you've had a, a major wardrobe <laughs> malfunction on TV? I think Triple H would go back to it. I think there was a visible skid mark at one point in the Foley, uh, in the Foley Fruit of the Looms. Yeah, I believe that may have been the first time I had that type of uh, wardrobe <laughs> malfunction. I think we need to point out, this was the first WWE pay-per-view without Steve or yes. Rock headlining in quite a while. And Triple H is trying he's trying to make that um, expansion of It's front. not a two man race he belongs to uh, and yeah. you are as well. Yeah. And you guys are really the pillars of the company mm-hmm. at that point. But with Steve on the shelf and the rock in the rumble, it's kinda up to you guys yeah, to tell the story for the title here. It is. Um the show itself is down 50,000 buys from the 99 Royal Rumble. Do you contribute that to the, just the ebb and flow of the business, or is that just awesome? Well, 50, it was still a really good buy rate, right? Oh, huge, be yeah. Well over 500. Keep in mind that the previous year, we had me and Rock uh, in, the, in the title main event, and also Vince as a first-time entrant, where he and Shane did those remarkable series. All those vignettes. Uh, the vignettes. Yeah. I mean, Vince's chicken. addition into the Rumble, uh, I think, was really valuable. So I thought being down 50 um, and an era when a lot of people were pirating the product. Yes. That's uh, I mean, that's a 10, down 10%, but uh, the year before had been up so much. Yes. Um, that we were jumping from 300, you know, for the December pay-per-view to 600. So to go from whatever it was, 300 to 550, by it's the still measures hugely of the time. Profitable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm curious from your standpoint, uh, how, how are you putting together a match like this? You know that 
you've been in charge of the promos. You're going to get to do this match as Cactus Jack. You've campaigned for it a while. Vince finally, you know, gives in and says, okay, we'll do it. Uh, but now you're going to be able to put together a match and quote unquote, tell a story. Do you have that same amount of liberty that you did in the promos where it's, what do you want to do? Yeah. This is before the producers started playing a bigger role. Okay. At that point they were listening and they would come in with, uh, uh, perspectives. But I mean, what Hunter and I had, it was really free reign. And also one of the deals I made with Vince that if I was going to get into shape, uh, I convinced him to take me off the house shows for at least a month. And so I had almost unlimited time to think about this match. Now, a lot of my great thinking came in car rides, which I didn't have at that point. But nonetheless, I was so focused and I had definite ideas about what I wanted to, to do. And, uh, and uh, Hunter and I got together and uh, we came up with a plan that worked out perfectly. Was there anything Hunter was hesitant to do? I mean, is there anything you felt strongly about? You I'm know, just... I, I do regret that I um, I used the uh, uh, two different barbed wire two by fours, and Hunter did too. And a month later, I'm hitting him in the head with uh, a real legit uh, barbed wire. But people could see that uh, if you look closely, the barbed wire hit Hunter with was not the same one that we pulled out from underneath the uh, time, you know, the referee, the announcer's table, and he used on me. And so he, he we should have just used the same one. It was a small little thing. And again, people were so happy at what we were giving them that, I mean, I'm sure there were a few cynics who did see the sleight of hand, but they, and even if people did see it, uh, they gave us a pass because everything else was, it's hard to say that Triple H wasn't, contributing when Correct. he wrestled most of that match with, with, a puncture leg. <laughs> with a huge puncture wound from the shard of wood that I suplexed him on. So that was a gutsy, like we talk about Patrick Mahomes oh, yeah. and, uh, and Cody uh, with, the, with the terribly uh, torn pack. I would put Hunter's performance up there with Schilling and Mahomes and Cody. I would because he had to go another... 20 minutes? Yeah, it was early in the match. And he incorporated the injury into the match, and it was a really amazing showcase for him. I don't remember there being a big backlash about there being two I two by fours. So. But yeah. I I do remember the injury, the rather gruesome injury to Hunter's leg. And I know in hindsight, I wonder, you know, did they think it was necessary? Uh, I guess my question is, was Hunter hesitant to take the real barbed wire? No. That was a WWE uh, call? That was... A me call. Okay. Yeah, maybe there was a little bit of ego there, like, I'm going to take the real one. I got But you. at no point did Hunter say he didn't want to take it. Right. I think a month later he said he definitely wanted to take it, and we did. But that's a really minor point. Sure. You know, when you look at the bigger picture. Um, I. Who, who helps put together a match like that? I know you said this before the agents were really involved, but... Is there a third voice at all, or is it simply you you guys just going back and forth? And is it something you talk about for weeks leading up to it, a few days leading up to it, or just that day at the building? Conrad, this was only one of three matches that I had a really good idea from A to Z. Okay. Uh, the other two being uh, a match with Wing Kenimura that he put together completely, went over it with me when I did my first, I only did two matches for FMW, and this was one that he had obviously put so much thought into it. They looked it over. It was on paper. And I went, sounds good to me. Right. Like I had no, I, maybe I said, oh, hey, what if we did this twice or whatever the case was. But this guy had obviously put so much time and thought. And that's the way I was with this one. And then the other one was with uh, Randy Orton at Backlash. So when two of your top five matches ever are, you know, thought out A to Z, it's tough to knock the kids today it. Yes. for saying, back in my day, we right. called stuff in the ring. Yeah, we did. And some of it was great, but some of it was not. Right. Um, and this is before the era of the ultra close up and the high definition. Uh, so I did, I did not often line up, like I said, only two of my own matches and then one with Wing Kenimura lining up the whole thing. But that was a good match, too, a really good match, I thought, that we had in Japan. But those two, uh, being in the top five, I think are proof that yeah. uh, there's no one way to get over the finish line. 
how would you say that your philosophy to how you approach a match and how you work the body of a match and tell a story differs from Hunter? Do you guys pretty in lockstep on the way you see matches and stories in the business? I think so. I remember going back to when uh, we had our first program, Mankind and the Connecticut Blue Blood, that it was my first time as a babyface, and I think we've talked about this on the show, um, that you know he, he thought one big comeback as opposed to a few mini comebacks and hope spots. And Mankind was fighting from underneath, but as far as the hope spots, we threw it all into one big comeback. And yeah. that's where I, I did, I don't wanna make a, how do I make a comeback? How do I make it signature? And that's where I came up with the idea that after a couple moves, I would sit, rock, pull the hair, throw it. And nobody had done anything remotely like that. Right. It was either that or go. <laughs> right. <laughs> For those of you listening, I am doing the classic, go, come on, come on, you know, the classic. Why, set, I, ought why I ought to. Oh, God, I can't wait to get my hands on you. See, we're all putting our own twist on that, right. you know. Not everybody can do that, hit the mat, come on, you know. Um, so we were putting all our twist on it. But it was, Hunter and I, I think, had uh, very similar philosophies to how, uh, you know, you could get over without going over, that this was going to be a great showcase for both of us. And look, he went so far out of his way yes. to make me, to fulfill that legend that we had created with Cactus Jack. The match was incredible. Uh, I encourage everybody to go out of your way to watch it. Of course, it's on Peacock. Meltzer would write, Cactus versus Helmsley was a bona fide match of the year candidate, and in hindsight, probably should have gone on last. The feeling was that nobody at this point should be asked to follow The Rock, and the WWF likes to go off the, uh, off the air at all possible with a match where the baby face gets his hand raised. But the Royal Rumble absolutely could not follow the title match. Mm. Still, it was the best pay-per-view show from any company in several months. Was that a point of pride for you and Hunter that y'all wanted to go last? Or did you sort of understand, well, it's the rumble? You know, we had um, asserted ourselves so many times that I don't think we cared where we were. You know, I think, you know, it was a matter of belief in yourself. You know, I think both of us thought that we were the main event that year, regardless of where we were on. And I do... And I do remember growing up as a WWE fan, they liked to send fo- fans home happy. Now, there were uh, over the years, that would change to where it seemed like we were deliberately messing with people's hopes, you know, where you're beating Charlotte in yes. Charlotte, you're yes. beating Sasha in Boston. Like, it was almost like we're making it a point to send people home yes. uh, sad. Um, but at that time, you know, when I... When I was growing up and watching the shows and going to the shows, if you were gonna have an inconclusive finish, it would go on before intermission. And then you would send people home happy with a six man. That yeah. wasn't the advertised main event, but ended up being the final match. Um, so I was okay with that. The, uh, the way this show is written about, I just wanna remind everybody what an iconic show it is. Where else could you see as good of a street fight as you could ever see? Uh, The first ever tag team tables match between the Dudleys and the Hardys with all kinds of stunts and dives. Mae Young is going to flash her breasts, which Mm -hmm. is always fun. Prosthetic, by the way. Uh, It was Richie Posner, just in case you were wondering. Keep me at home, yep. And and then there's Taz's debut. And we touched on it a little earlier. He was a guy who had been this unbeatable, unstoppable monster in ECW, an incredible run. He's going to make his debut in New York on pay-per-view, and hand Kurt Angle his first loss. Yep. What an incredible introduction for the character. And then pretty quickly we realize they're not going to present him the same way ECW yeah. did. And in my opinion, it's one of the bigger fumbles of the era. Mm-hmm. I know you kept up with the ECW product when you could. Uh, why do you think the Taz experiment didn't go better? <sighs> Is it politics? I think I think that played a role. I think a few key people got in Vince's ear, and Vince went. I remember Taz saying he asked him, you know, at the their interview together, you know, or the meeting, you know, about the fact that he, you know, the WWE could be the land of the giants, and he was only five eight. And Vince said, "We're going to promote that." 
Uh, it's a shame because I, I was keeping up with ECW, but I was on the road all the time, so I wasn't getting to see the show that much. When you see clips of Taz versus Bam Bam, Unbelievable. and you see a guy who believed in himself and believed in his own gimmick in a positive way, yes, and then you just see the Taz in WWE, there was just something a little off. Well, he started that way. Yeah, he start, I mean, this incredible, the, yeah, I always point to that reaction he got at the Garden as proof that he could have had an amazing run. And he's gone on to be this great announcer and, you know, a cornerstone of, uh, you know, he WWE announcing, um, Impact, uh, A&E. I, always, I think he's a great announcer, quick wit, you know, and his uh, your son's doing really well for himself. He could have and should have been a bigger star in WWE, though. No doubt about it. Well, if you know one thing for sure, it's uh, Mick and I know where the good eating is. And it's at Jimmy's Famous Seafood.com. That's right. You don't have to make a road trip to Baltimore. Now you can bring Jimmy's to your front door. I don't know what you're thinking. Boy, that shipping's got to be expensive. Uh uh. Not with our brand new promo code. That's right. Now you can get free two day nationwide shipping all at Jimmy's Famous Seafood.com. All you got to do is remember our promo code. You to guess what it is? Come on. You already know Foley F O L E Y is how you're going to get the best crab cakes you ever had in your life delivered right to your front door. Listen, if you've heard me brag about these crab cakes for years and not tried them yet, what are you waiting for? As long as you order 125 bucks worth of food, you're going to get free shipping with the promo code Foley free shipping. Now as somebody who's been a long time consumer of Jimmy's, I can tell you shipping seafood from Baltimore to Alabama, not exactly cheap. They're hooking you up here. They're doing it free. I recommend the Maryland crab cakes. I recommend the crab balls. My man, JR loves the soups and the chowders and the oysters. My dad loves their signature steaks. He didn't believe me when I said that I had some of the best steaks I'd ever had at Jimmy's, but it's true, man. I'll never forget the first time John slid me over the prime rib and said, just try this dude, 10 out of 10 at a seafood joint. Who knew? And they got incredible desserts. They got gluten-free items and they've got awesome gifts. If you're trying to buy something for somebody in your life, nobody has ever opened a box of Jimmy's and been disappointed. It's never happened. Check it out. They got the famous gift box. They've even got a tailgate bundle just in time for these NFL playoffs. Check them out, man. Jimmy's famous seafood.com. Use our promo code Foley. You'll be glad you did. This is a family owned business around for more than four decades. You've seen them with Bobby Flay. You've seen them with Guy Fieri. You've seen them on the Ravens games. They're the real deal. They're friends of ours. They're wrestling fans like me and you. And I think you should check them out. Support them. Support a small business. Go ahead. Check it out. Jimmy's famous seafood.com. The promo code is Foley. Seriously. The best crab cakes in the world are Jimmy's famous seafood.com. Uh, here's what you wrote in your book about this match. For the first time in years, I felt like I was in shape when I stepped into the ring in Madison square garden for the Royal rumble. I'd been training hard and I knew I was prepared. I walked back into the dressing area 27 minutes later with a half dozen thumbtacks stuck in the temple of my head, barbed wire holes in my back and stomach, sweat pouring out of my body and feeling of total professional redemption. Mm -hmm. I wish it had been my last match. It was that good. Triple H was at his absolute best here. And I was only a small step behind the rumble match was a brutal, beautiful, emotional affair. And in many ways was like a dream come true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It certainly was. And it's funny how you can remember those little things. Like I alluded to saying Triple H was at the top of his game and I was just a small step behind. It was great. And then we had the photo backstage with me and Hunter. I think that was in the, uh, maybe uh, the second book. I can't remember which book it was in. Um, but it's a uh, Triple H is just, you know, he's swathed in gauze, uh, you know, he's, he bled heavily from the forehead as well. It was, it was, a, it was really, uh, happy moment for me. Let's talk about some of the, the moments in the match, the mat, the moment where the, uh, the board from the pallet goes into Hunter's leg, obviously not planned, not part of the program. It could have been, obviously. I see Grillo looking for the photo. We're going to find it or not find it depending on which book. Oh, it'll on. be there. Okay. Uh, is there panic in your mind? Like you've laid out this match a to Z. And you just said this is something you rarely did. At this point, this is only the second yeah. time you've done it. And now someone's injured. And I know if I shouldn't say I know. I feel like if it was you, you would have said, Well, I don't care. Let's just let's just keep going. But with Hunter, 
does part of you get nervous? Like, oh man, he's hurt for real. We may have to deviate here. Sure. Is there panic or are you thinking about calling an audible? Are you guys communicating through that? I think he conveyed to me. I didn't know where the injury came from okay. until a minute or two. I didn't even know he was injured until a minute or so later. And then I see this blood, I use the word term cascading. Yes. And uh, eventually coagulating to where it looks like a red flavored gelatin stuck to his calf. Uh, I think he conveyed to me that he was going to be able to work through it. If he wouldn't, it would not have been able, it wouldn't have been through lack of will, but, you know, uh, through, uh, uh, you know, the inability due to injury. Right. But he worked through it, uh, both the will and the, phys- you know, the physical ability to continue on was there that night. I want to talk about the violence because we, we are going to see you guys go through tables and some of the wood pallets and there's barbed wire wrapped two by fours and chairs and eventually thumbtacks. Was there a line that WWE wouldn't let you cross in this match? Is there something you advocated for? Well, and they said, well, you can't do that. Look, we crossed it the year before with yes. me and mankind and rock. Um, so we didn't want that. And then we did allude to that spot because I yes. was handcuffed and then yes. Dwayne came out, saved the day. Now the handcuffing was, I was a little more comfortable. I had several links to work with. Um, so I did some selling, you know, while I was handcuffed. And I think even mounted a little mini comeback while I was handcuffed. And then when it looked like we were going to see uh, an ode to uh, the year before, Rock came out with the, the keys. So I thought that was a nice... Hope spot. I can't remember for sure if Vince spoke to us, but it would seem in keeping, uh, uh, you know, with what the reality of what we had done the year before and the acknowledgement that it had crossed the line that we should not cross a certain line. And I don't think we did. Right. So uh, I think um, the proof is, and I want to make sure I don't go to the pudding reference too often. Uh, the proof is that people can watch the, the, uh, Rumble match with Triple H over and over and yes. enjoy it. And very few people want to watch that I quit match more than once. Like yeah, it's that's another level. That's enough. Yeah, it was too much. It got to the point where you start, you're, you know, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. It's not enjoyable and shouldn't be duplicated. Let's talk about the barbed wire for a minute because you did mention that there were two. I bring this up again because I know that just a few weeks prior to this, the Nevada, or not the Nevada, force a habit, the New York State Athletic Commission would not allow ECW to use barbed wire. Ooh. You guys are using barbed wire. Ooh. I think we could put two and two together and say, well, they're probably making we a lot were... more money on the WWE show. Or maybe we pulled a fast one. I think ah. the second one was, since you said Hunter didn't ask for it, and yeah. maybe you thought maybe you did it as a point of pride, maybe we had one we showed the commission, and then we had one that we took some bumps with. Possibly that. Yeah, that does sound like something we might have done. Hypothetically. Hypothetically. Oh, I like that. I mean, I think the well, statute of limitations has passed. Yeah. Now. They're probably okay. When you come back through the curtain after a match like this, um, you've talked before about that post match euphoria. Yeah. That's really hard to get. But I'm curious from this standpoint, you've got a whole bunch of guys who are getting ready to run out and do the rumble still. And I know sometimes you've talked about how after you were on last and you had that euphoria, there's nobody back there. Nobody there. In this case, everybody's still there. Mm-hmm. Uh, does this match mean more to you because they were there to share in it? What were those moments when you come back? It, it helped. Now, going back to not letting anybody else define for being yes. successes, you should be able to appreciate what you've done, even if there's nobody there to celebrate it with. But this is something that Drew and I talked about on the on our flight saying that, you know, whether people have to stay or not, as soon as the bell rings, boom, they're out of there to beat the traffic. Because if you don't get out before the fans, you might as well wait an extra 90 minutes until after they're gone. Because that middle area can be really difficult. With fans out of appreciation, they're, you know, the rocking your car and trying to make a connection in a way that's not, you know, fun for the driver or the inhabitants of that vehicle, the passengers of that vehicle. Uh, so I understand wanting to get out. I don't blame yes. people, but it is nice to have an atmosphere yes. where you come back and people are there. And there is a little sense of loneliness, you know? I mean, go back what, one more month, Triple H and I in the uh, 
uh, cell. I mean, I got to see my brother and my father. And then I went back to my hotel room and I broke down and cried all by myself because you're alone. Yeah. You know, where you really wish you had your wife and kids with you or some of the guys. Uh, that's a reason I connected with the Kevin Costner movie for Love of the Game. He pitches his no, his perfect game. He goes out with John C. Riley, his catcher and the guys. He carries John C. Riley back to his room. He goes into his beautiful suite and he breaks down and cries because the woman that means the most to him is not there to share it with. Yeah. So I get that and I am far from the only, uh, you know, uh, WWE superstar or, or Al Snow to have. That's, <laughs> that's just a cheap shot. It's just a cheap shot. But we, you, you lulled us into a false sense of security. We didn't <laughs> see that one coming. But I'm willing to bet there have been a lot of... Uh, um, uh, a lot of people over the years who felt that way yeah. after a big match. I mean, I think Roddy talked a lot about that. that yeah. You have this euphoria and high of all these people and then nothing. Especially when you have to get in the car and drive. I always thought that was the most difficult part about mania is that instead of someone coming out after you win a Super Bowl and say, you won the, you know, won the Super Bowl, what are you doing? I'm going to Disneyland. And when they ask us, you just, you know, had a four-star classic at WrestleMania. How are you going to celebrate? Well, I'm going to get in my car. I'm going to drive 250 Milwaukee. miles, and then I'm going to try <laughs> to reach that emotion. Yeah, it's really difficult to yes. do. And I, I like the fact that the Raws are in the uh, same town now. The same town, so guys don't have men. Guys collectively, meaning yeah. men and women, uh, don't have to make that ride. You know, I got to ask. You take the pedigree and the thumbtacks. Uh, so the thumbtacks are in your face and obviously we've talked a lot about head safety. This is not a dangerous spot for that, but I am curious, are you worried about your eye? A little bit, but this is where I've told this story, um, at my shows over the years. This is where it goes back to what Bruce Pritchard said about the rock going live, you know, live and being yep. willing to take that, um, chewing out. Uh, easier to do it and apologize than it is to get permission. So Vince said to us specifically, no thumbtacks. Well, yes, sir. And then when he walks away, Hunter goes, did you already put them under the ring? I said, yeah, we're okay. But we didn't know if we were going to use them until we knew I was, I mean, we knew we'd use them, but as far as taking the pedigree, that was an audible. Yeah, really? uh, that was an audible, and this is where the Foley instantaneous risk reward ratio analysis comes into play, because I ha I know the tax are out there, and I you know I ponder the wisdom of taking that pedigree in the middle of the thumb tax, and I realize a I could lose an eye in there, but imagine the pop. Oh. And in this case, I just thought instantaneously, I'm going to close my eyes tightly as I can, uh, I did, t t I took a Try really to good pedigree. A yeah, yeah, there's no way that tack's really going to make it into that. I'm turned my, to have my face turned, and it was this great visual where I had four or five, I think yeah. I said half a dozen in the head, and uh, and it made for an amazing uh, moment. So I was glad we did it. I didn't think it was overkill. I thought it really added to the match. So you mentioned... You had the whole match planned out A to Z, but that was an audible. Ah, it was an audible. What yeah, was the original Z? Do you remember? I think we always wanted to do something in the tax, but I thought it was going to be uh, the pedigree, I believe. Maybe I was going to kick out of the So it was still going to be a pedigree, but maybe not a pedigree into the yeah, tax. Yeah, definitely not a pedigree in the tax. And when you, I assume you guys communicate and you call that in the ring, is Hunter hesitant or is he cool nah, with that? No, he was on board. Yeah. We we both knew we were willing to take that chewing out, but we didn't get one. We did not get one. Uh, so we did defy Mr. McMahon and made him like it. What a match. I think it's the greatest Royal Rumble match at any Royal Rumble ever. I encourage everybody to go out of your way to see it. Uh, I, I wasn't even there, and I'm a little disappointed Meltzer gave it four and a half stars. If that's not a five-star match, I don't know what it is. It's six and a quarter. Well, By the new, no, it was. I'm happy with four and a half. Believe me, it was an amazing match. It, did we miss anything about Royal Rumble? I think 2000? we were pretty. Uh, we were pretty thorough. We were pretty thorough. I appreciate the time today. I can't wait for the Rumble this weekend. 
And I hope everybody comes to see you in San Antonio, man. I hope so, too. Now I'm in a situation where I'm alone in a hotel room. I'd uh, be nice if somebody was there. Well, I'll see which, uh, uh, I'll see if uh, Trish or Lita or uh, maybe we can get a few of the boys and women together to watch that. If Tori's there, that ask watch. her about them bad boys. Just see what happens. <laughs> We'll be back next week right here on Folia's Pod <laughs> talking about your WCW run in early 1990. And, of course, you did mention you will have some downtime in the hotel. And I know whenever you're alone in a hotel, there's one thing you like to do that nobody else likes to do, okay. and that's cameo. Cameo. I think other people do enjoy it. I think I get more out of it. You enjoy it more than anybody I else. enjoy it more than anybody. And yes. that's one of the things. If people want to go to cameo, if they're on the fence, Cameo.com slash Mick Foley. Just look at some of the previous yes. uh, videos and also the feedback because it is oh, just very frequently people being surprised at how much I put into it and how much I appear to be enjoying myself. So I really do. Go on there. I didn't have the type of year I did this last year that I had previous years, but I think I'm trying to find out if I was still the most requested athlete or wrestler for a third year running. And it's only because word has gotten around. Yes. Uh, the price is pretty good. It's, 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 it's steep, but not a lot and not, uh, elaborate. Um, or, or not egregious. Yeah. Egregious is the word I'm looking for. Or one of the words. Um, and I love, I love doing them and, uh, people, people get that. So thank you to everyone who has ordered one and everyone who's thinking of it. Check them out at cameo.com. Slash Mick Foley. And in the meantime, don't forget to check out Foley is Pod shirts. There you'll find that brand new King of the Death Match turnbuckle, along with the poster and, of course, our hottest selling tee that Mick is wearing right now. Uh, plus, you'll even see our brand new Phantom Balls shirt, our Mr. January shirt, our Hardcore Legend shirt, and what started it all, the Mr. In Your House tees. It's all available now at FoleyIsPodShirts.com. Keep up with us on uh, Twitter. To the tune at- of Follow the Yellow Brick, brick Road. <laughs> to tickle, the, tickle the phantom balls. I tickle the phantom balls. With it. Tickle, 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 tickle the, the phantom, phantom balls. balls. <laughs> FoleyIsPodShirts.com. Hit us on Twitter, at FoleyIsPod. On Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, that's at FoleyIsPod. And if this is fun to listen to, it's even more fun to watch it. Hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, turn your notifications bell on for Foley on YouTube.com. That's Foley on YouTube.com. We'll be back next week right here on Foley is Pod. Yeah. Hey, guys, Tony Schiavone. Need to call a timeout real quick. Wanted to tell your listeners what I've been telling what happened when listeners for a while now about all the cool things happening over on adfreeshows.com. On a brand new edition of Insiders, Gary Juster sits down with Conrad to discuss his decades spent behind the scenes in AWA, NWA, WCW, and ROH. I don't think it was a battle with Eric so much on uh, TV versus house shows. It was a matter of if they're not making money, we got to figure out, you know, something else. You know, we just can't let it bleed like that. We go one-on-one with WWE Hall of Famer Teddy Long as he joins Mike Chioda for a special edition of Monday Mailbag. And so I'm tired, man. I'm really tired, but I don't want to let Mike drive because I already know, you know, I already know how he drives. So anyway, I just couldn't take it no further. So I said, Mike, you know, go ahead and, you know, you know take us in. So I got in, let Mike start driving. I guess, man, I went right to sleep if I was tired. So I guess maybe 10 minutes into that ride, all of a sudden I wake up, we're like in a tailspin. Royal Rumble season is here, and we watch back the most memorable rumble of all time, featuring the most iconic robe of all time, alongside the nature boy himself. Um, I mean, there was only one Olivia Walker. She was classic. and uh, But I, I just, out of nowhere, I just decided to... Uh, to pick that color in black, you know, here's the deal. I, I, I've never had a great physique, and you know that black makes you look leaner. So black on black, black boots. So I went to, I went to black a lot after about 40, age of 41. <laughs> that, very simple, honest answer. That's just a small taste of what we've got waiting for you. With four levels to choose from, see for yourself. Why Ad Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adfreeshows.com. 
can't believe this is real, but Wu Wings, your very own virtual restaurant concept, is now open and fans can enjoy the legendary flavors and world championship wings by ordering with their Uber Eats or Postmates app. Woo Wings is now open in Nashville, San Antonio, Jacksonville, as well as Huntsville and Tuscaloosa, right here in Alabama. Many more locations coming soon. As a virtual restaurant, Woo Wings is looking to partner with existing restaurants in major metro areas. Tell your favorite sports bar or local restaurant you want Woo Wings in your town. And to visit rickflairwings.com for more information on how to become a partner. But if you're in Nashville, San Antonio, Jacksonville, Huntsville, or Tuscaloosa, hop on your Uber Eats or Postmates app and look for Woo Wings and try the only chicken wings worthy of hearing the name of the 16-time world heavyweight champion, Woo Wings. Be sure to check out rickflairwings.com to become a partner.